to diagnostic promises a revolutionary technology that would drastically change the blood testing. Through diagnostics, technology could quickly conduct comprehensive tests using just a few drops of blood from a finger prick at a fraction of the current cost of the traditional lab tests. So, Hannah Wendt, co-founder of True Diagnostic, I would like you to reflect on these statements. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is 99.99% true, right? I leave, I, I say 99.9%. You, you never know what's what's going to happen throughout life, right? Life is very unexpected and gives you curveballs. We can't predict the future. So I'll leave out that 0.01%. But we're absolutely seeing it. So I know you've spoken with my co-founder, Ryan Smith, previously as well. But right now, we're actually able to predict about 4,000 additional biomarkers, including clinical lab values, proteomic markers, metabolomic markers, just with a couple drops of blood. And I shouldn't say couple, maybe I should say 10 to 15. It's, it's a small blood spot card. It's about the size of a quarter, but it really is causing a paradigm shift in medicine. I would go as far to say medicine and not even traditional laboratory testing, which is a $200 billion market. So we're sitting at a very interesting, exciting intersection of health and wellness through this novel biomarker of epigenetics. So let me give a little bit of context of that quote. I asked ChatGPT, what did Elizabeth Holmes and Terranos promised to their customers? And this was its answer. And I replaced Terranos with True Diagnostic. So that shows the magnitude of the things we are dealing with here. How's, how's your, how's True Diagnostic different from Terranos? We are different in a very specific way. We're not making promises. We're doing it, right? We have research-backed evidence, and we will not offer a product until we know it's scientifically valid. We're very clear and transparent on that as well. You're, you got lucky today. I'm not wearing my black turtleneck with my, my hair up. I, I have been... <laughs> I'm guilty of doing that previously, actually. And someone called me out on, on a call and said, you look like Elizabeth Holmes right now. And I was like, oh my gosh, uh, it, was, it was pretty comical. But we do get that question sometimes, right? What's the difference? This seems too good to be true. One of the differences I think as well is, you know, we own our own laboratory in Lexington, Kentucky. Everything is sent to our lab. We're not outsourcing to any other third parties. Your data is not going anywhere. We're a privately held company. We have been bootstrapped since the beginning. We haven't taken any outside investments. So it's very, very different when comparing to Theranos. We're not giving you a device, you know, in office to run these samples instantaneously. Um, I do also receive that question a lot if we will have a device where people can put it in their homes or their healthcare provider offices and get that information back. And maybe in the future, I, I, I don't think that's in the near future, but it is definitely a possibility. How many tests have you sold so far? Yeah, we've sold around 75,000 tests so far. So not all of them have been returned or run to date. But we've been doing an increase in volume ever since we've been open, which we started the company around late. August 2019, but we're in our first sample in July of 2020. Well, what's the what's the co-founder story, the founding story of the company? Yeah, it's a, a pretty interesting one, especially knowing where True Diagnostic is today. So a little bit about my background. I'm from Ohio, just a couple hours north of Lexington, Kentucky. And I came down to Kentucky in 2015 for school, graduated in, in 2019 from UK. I've always really been interested in, in science, you know, how the world works, how the body works, and took an interesting position right outside of school at a compounding pharmacy. It was the fourth fastest growing healthcare company in the nation in 2019. It specialized in unique peptide products and pharmaceuticals that were pretty cutting edge. And we focused on serving healthcare providers who were all cash pay, right? Treating healthy patients and not necessarily following the traditional sick care model. 
So it was very exciting, a lot of research and development going behind the actual products. We were definitely pioneers in the space. In 2019, this would be spring, regulators came down pretty heavy on the compounding space in general. So by definition, by law, there was you know a definitive date where moving forward, we weren't able to do anything that wasn't FDA approved. <laughs> So it became a lot less fun and way more boring. So behind the scenes at the pharmacy, we always wanted to understand how can we add more quantitative data to prove that these peptide and unique products that may not have a lot of research quantitatively on them, you know, prove to regulators that that they can they can actually help. Behind the scenes, we were saying, well, how do we measure that? What's the number one kind of factor to rule them all? And of course, we came across aging, right, being the number one risk factor for all cause mortality and morbidity, and after that, it's how do you measure aging, right? Do you measure it through grip strength, VO2 max, telomere lengths? Uh, and then we came across the epigenetic DNA methylation that we now know today uh, as the, the best marker of, of biological aging. So sold the pharmacy, created True Diagnostic, really uh, full force in, in about 2020, uh, ran the first sample then in July of 2020 and, and you know, have been going through a lot of other different revenue streams ever since. We do a lot of third-party processing. We have our own third-party logistics lab. We do a lot of R&D um, and kind of creating our own DNA methylation analysis suite software to read and interpret large epigenetic data sets as well. Okay. So it was Ryan and you? Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can give you more, more information about the, the backstory too, if you're, if you're super interested. I know that was more high level. Um, yeah. You know, right when we wanted to start the company as well. We flew out to UCLA. We met with Dr. Steve Horbath right away in, in 2019. We met with several companies who are also doing biological age testing in this space because we didn't want to create our own company, right? That's, that's hard work. So we wanted to partner with someone and just bring our audience, that integrative functional cash pay medicine audience to them because we knew it was a, a need in, in the field. People wanted to measure this risk factor, aging again. And they did not have the same outlook on the field as we did. We saw this as an opportunity for growth, something where we could create, again, new and novel biomarkers. But they were using some older versions of those biological age clocks or what we know today as the first generation clock. So we said, screw it. Let's go back to Lexington. Bought a multi-million dollar, 20,000 square foot building. And it was an old insurance building. Tore the insides out, created the lab, and uh, yeah, I've been running ever since. Okay, and where the over time you encountered an opportunity to do to do a longevity leaderboard, uh, which is called Rejuvenation Olympics. I would like to ask you about that. How do you, as a company, feel about uh, the Rejuvenation Olympics? It's you said it's not your main priority, but your making it one. Yeah, I think as a company, we're super excited about it, right? We have a really great relationship with Brian Johnson, a great relationship with his team, and a lot of the longevity enthusiasts who are involved in it, like Michael Lescart and Ben Greenfield, um, David Pasco. There's a couple of other big names. Steve Aoki, who's on the board as well on the Rejuvenation Olympics board or was at one point. So we love it. It brings in conversations like this, right? It brings in a really large community and not necessarily a super edgy or competitive community. The goal of the community is to not die and to extend lifespan and have more time together. So it acts as a way to push humanity and the limits and really be the best version of yourself. So it's a really fun competition. Um, I mentioned that it hasn't been our, our biggest priority in the past just because of all of our other research and development going on and making more and better predictors. So we just came out with our Omic MH in October, which was our main focus for our first three and a half years of running the business. And now that we have that, it's the best biological age clock that's ever been created to date because it's the most predictive of all cause mortality, morbidity when you compare it against any others. So even um, so, done done pace? Um, it's different. They're different biomarkers. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to compare them head to head. Again, Omic MH is so new still. Um, but in terms of mortality and mor morbidity, I would say, or I'll, I'll go just death in general. The Omic MH is the best at that. The pace of aging is going to be more of an instantaneous rate of aging that's better at capturing change and quick change 
as to someone's aging trajectory over time. And then the symphony age is really good at individual disease outcomes. So it's best at predicting onset of specific disease based on the individual system or score that you're looking at. And what will it result to um, many different leaderboards? Are, is there going to be one that rules them all? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to even send in and share mock-ups of actually what the website will, will look like. But um, essentially, it's going to still be the same thing that you're seeing with the uh, Dunedin pace right now. So it's going to be the average, right, of the, the three Dunedin paces across the six-month mark. Remember to be on there. You need to take the test at least three times with the first and third being at least six months apart. So you're going to get that that average kind of pace. Um, you're going to get the percentage improved from baseline as well. So that'll be standard with the Dunedin pace. That's what's live at the moment. Now, the symphony age leaderboard is going to be showing you the biological age of 11 distinct organ systems. And you can switch between, you know, system, you can search for your name to see where you rank. And this is going to be, this one's a little bit harder because it's... So, so it goes up to not only the top 20, but you can search for your name. Where do you rank exactly? That's, that's the goal once we get all the data in. So yeah, one of the hard parts about Rejuvenation Olympics, which I think you're aware about, is consent, right? We're not posting anything without anyone's consent. And it's really crucial that we have that. So um, if we have the consent, we'll hopefully be able to put everyone on there and then they can actually search through everyone who has consented and see where they rank uh, amongst them if so, they fit the, the qualifying criteria. So from a software design point of view, what, what would be the problem? Whoever is, whoever is registering their Dunedin pace into the, the website, into the Rejuvenation Olympics website, then that's an automatic consent of being there. So we have this done. We have something else done from a software standpoint. So when you purchase a true diagnostic kit, if you have one, you know you have to register the kit on the true diagnostic website, right? And previously they were hosted on, on different domains. So this is what made the cross-checking a very manual process in terms of consent. What we did though is now added Rejuvenation Olympics consent on the true diagnostic registration. That's actually live. So when you're registering your true diagnostic kit, you don't also have to go to Rejuvenation Olympics and say, hey, I want to be a part of this. So for every single kit you register, you can choose by kit if you want that one to be included or not. So let's zoom out a little bit and think about longevity as a sport. What's your big vision? What, sure, uh, from a company point of view, you can say that uh, if the Rejuvenation Olympics is successful, then we are going to sell more tests. But do you have another kind of vision here uh, for the games? In terms of the Rejuvenation Olympics games, is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think it all comes down to, you know, again, more of a, a, a better world, not to sound super cliche, right? But these leaderboards were created initially as a way to hold people accountable for how they're aging. You see a lot of construed information on social media of people saying, I reduced my biological age by 10 or 20 years, or, you know, I'm actually, you know, 50 years old chronologically, but my biological age says I'm 20. That's just not true. It's not how these biological age predictors work. So the Rejuvenation Olympics was really a way initially to hold people accountable, right? To put everyone in a way that they can be comparable to one another. And I think the more we started to iron that out, we were realizing, hey, we're actually creating again, a really nice community. When, when people ask the same question that you're asking, What's the future hold for longevity, the leaderboards, the entire vision? We just want to encourage people to be better and to perform more of these N of 1 precision-based studies on themselves. I get the question all the time. It's probably the number one most asked question. Hey, how do I reverse my biological age? And my answer is the same every single time. I don't know. You're going to have to try what works for you <laughs> because you can look at these general population studies and you can get some ideas or hints as to what may work, right? But you don't know that it's going to work on an individual level. And that's very, very important. I know what works for me. 
and, and I can I can go through some of the things that I do on a daily basis to hopefully extend my longevity or make me feel better and, and look better quantitatively according to, to our testing. But it comes down to what works for you. And that's why the Rejuvenation Olympics is so important because you can start to share and talk about those different strategies and may want to try something that someone else is trying, whether it be at, you know, different dosing or the same frequency or, or interval. But we'll, we'll be encouraging, you know, a ton of conversations on social media. We'll hopefully be able to list people by user profiles and create a forum in the future. You know, we have plans to add protocols and data. So people are, again, are still registering those kits and giving us information on what they're currently doing. Um, but it's up to them to, you know, actually share it with the world. And, and I think we have a couple people on the leaderboard who do a really good job at that. Um, of course, Brian probably being <laughs> the the main example and, and putting everything he does out on a website publicly. Are there athletes, you know, uh, personally? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I know Michael Lescarton pretty well. He has actually been on my Everything Epigenetics podcast before. He has a great channel, a great YouTube channel too. I think that the company name is Conquer Aging or Die Trying. He was actually an English major undergrad and went back to school for his PhD in, I believe, some some area of exercise science. So he has a really great way of communicating research with people and what he's doing. He does a great job at also testing himself and only changing or trying to change one variable or factor. So he really understands how his metrics are moving according to that one variable or factor that he's changed. So Michael Lesgarten is an awesome example of someone who I would uh, say is a rejuvenation Olympic athlete and, and appeared on, on the leaderboard. Um, another one as well is going to be Jen Bell. So she is I think she became a rejuvenation Olympic athlete in the last round of updates, but she has a really great website. Um, she has, uh, she, she's pretty active, I think, on, on social media too. The last time I, I checked, I haven't looked at it in, in quite a while, um, but that is really great because she's going to have some information that's more women focused, right? I think we need both men and women on, on the board as a way to add value. Some of our, our healthcare providers are on there too. Uh, Dr. Diane Gingsberg, who runs a clinic, I believe in, in Texas. Um, she does some um, therapeutic plasma exchange. Uh, yeah, she's, she's in Texas. So she's someone we work with pretty closely um, and is a user of, of the kits, you know, in the clinic and, and for the research and personally too. Yeah, just a quick shout out to Jemba that she's running an ageless society uh, named Telegram Groups of Groups, you know. Uh, that's that's a very active and uh, interesting things are happening there for sure. Michael Lustgarden is someone I did not succeed to reach out. He, I can see he's, he's one of my favorite because he, he kind of embodies a certain kind of archetype of of the longevity athlete who is like trying to optimize one variable at a time with blood tests and all kind of stuff to get the best that need and pace. So he's, he's someone to I, I like to listen to. <laughs> yeah, he's he's really great. Um, him and I have actually known each other. I don't know for like three or maybe four years now since True Diagnostics inception, and he's definitely a, a colleague, a friend, and we have you know, regular conversations over email and he's, he's very intelligent. And I think, yeah, what, what he can communicate to people and his YouTube videos and how he creates them is very impressive. So there's something that I've seen you tweet about, and that's about C15. During my interviews, I noticed, and my research on the athletes, I noticed uh, many of them actually taking C15. There, there is a hype about it, right? Can you tell us what's going on? Yeah, so C15 is being brought into the longevity light. There's a lot of hype about it, as you mentioned, because of a company called Fatty15. They're a really cool, sexy company. They have, you know, nice, nice branding, great, amazing founders, and a really cool story behind it as well. So C15 in the context of supplements is a type of fatty acid, and it's a saturated fatty acid with 
some potential health benefits, maybe even some anti-aging, depending on how you want to define anti-aging benefits there too. Uh, But from a nutritional standpoint, it can have benefits that include anti-inflammatory properties, support for metabolic health, possibly improving heart health as well. It's usually sourced in whole fat dairy products, fish, specific plant oils. It's also available, um, obviously, in in the supplement form um, and why it's been very popularized now because of, again, Fatty 15 in that company. It can be really good, I think, for maintaining health or even a alternative to taking, you know, your omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids. I think there needs to be more studies to understand really how we can benefit from it and how it can be used effectively. Um, but I still think, you know, nonetheless, it's, it's pretty exciting. From a biological aging standpoint, there is a study that I spoke about where there is a correlation. And they used several second-generation clocks in this study, DNA methylation, phenol age, uh, DNA methylation, grim age, looking at about uh, 4,100 individuals, average age of 55 years old. And they discovered that higher levels of the C15, this fatty acid, were associated with slower biological aging, right? So participants who had increased levels of this particular lipid displayed younger biological aging compared to their biological age. So it's, yeah, solely a correlation though, right? Um, Which is how most of these studies are going to be presented at this time. You've done this test um, on other things as well. And if you you did then, what did you find the most correlative with biological aging clock, right, Danny Dampace? Yeah, by far, caloric restriction, 100%. And that is really going to even be evident through the calorie randomized control trial, the 10% overall caloric restriction in keyword healthy non-obese adults over a two-year period. And the Dunedin pace was really the only clock that significantly decreased over time through consistent caloric restriction. And that came out a couple years ago, published in Nature on, in February. And it just looked at first-generation Horvath and Hannum clocks, second-generation, Grim Age and Pheno Age. Grim Age looked okay, but it wasn't statistically significant. And the pace of aging was really the only one that could capture it, the Dunedin pace. So I think we have to have a consistent caloric restriction. I didn't look at time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting, right? Um, Just overall eating less. So so I noticed that uh, Dr. Background podcasters like to talk a lot about, okay, sleep well, exercise, and eat well, right? And, And yes, those are the the most impactful figured out so far other than some steroids we might so 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 that's okay but th- there is a cost benefit analysis and they only looking at the benefit and never really the costs of it so what are the costs of uh, calorie restriction the cost is that you are you are you're constantly thinking about it you have to prepare your food or plan and uh, that, that that's 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 a lot of time compared to just a oh, pill done you know like the cost of doing the second thing is much smaller than the cost of calorie restriction right so do we have something some low-hanging fruits here we do yes i would argue the opposite i think it's much easier to restrict your calories. So first and foremost, supplements are going to cost you money right out of your pocket. And you're not sure if you're deficient in those vitamins, if you're not doing proper testing, you're guessing on what's going to work. You're probably taking, you know, five to 20 pills a day or more, depending on your specific regimen. So I think there's a much, much higher you know, actual cost coming out of your pockets when it comes to supplements. And a lot of those, I would say, most of them, probably all of them, don't have randomized controlled clinical trials on them as it relates to biological aging. Now, when it comes to caloric restriction, though, some tips and tricks in my words of wisdom here is just change the quality of your food or what what you're eating. It doesn't necessarily, caloric restriction sounds super scary. People think, oh, I got to skip a meal or I just got to, you know, eat less. And 
that is one way to achieve it. Mentally, that's probably going to be a lot harder on you, like you mentioned, and may drive you to actually do the opposite and overeat, which we don't want. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a carnivore, om- omnivore, I eat anything and everything. Uh, I don't have a specific, you know, true diet that I, I follow. But one change that I've been making that I think is really simple and will resonate with listeners is I love breakfast. I eat a very high protein breakfast. I love sausage, bacon, traditional breakfast meats. <laughs> but if you switch traditional sausage or traditional bacon to turkey bacon or turkey sausage, you're already dropping. 200 to 400 calories in that one meal. And if you're eating a 2000 caloric based diet and you eat in that same fashion throughout the, the rest of the day, you're already at your 10% overall caloric restriction, right? So the, the cost there is when you're at the grocery store and you're already shopping for your food, instead of grabbing traditional bacon, you're just grabbing turkey bacon. It may cost you, you know, a dollar more or so, and it may even be less. I actually don't know the comparison. I'm just assuming uh, because it may be a little bit healthier and it's going to have better macronutrient profile on it anyways. Right. So, so there's, there's one little tip and and trick. Uh, There there are a couple others I have up my sleeve as well, but would love to hear your, your thoughts about that. I know. I, I really see like you, like these challenges. So I'm just going to throw you back another challenge about, it seems like you, you believe that in order for someone to do something, take a pill, let's say, you need randomized control trials. How do we even get to randomized control trials? We need money. <laughs> the world needs more money. So it's it's really sad, actually, right? We need more funding. There are some really great resources and videos, especially if you go through Dr. Matt Caverline's YouTube channel, his podcast with Optispan. He gives some really daunting numbers, I would say, as it relates to how much funding goes into the National Institute for Aging. People, uh, researchers in particular, laugh and call it the National Institute for Alzheimer's because I think about somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the entire budget for the NIA goes directly toward Alzheimer's. And we know there's many age-related diseases, right? Many randomized control trials that we can actually be looking at. And one really good example of this is the TAME trial. So this is a medication, it's not a supplement, but um, this was the trial for metformin to look at how metformin affects aging. So it's the, I think TAME stands for, yeah, targeting aging with metformin. And this study, I think initially was supposed to be underway like 10 years ago, and they still haven't done it because they don't have funding. And what they're doing is they're trying to raise a ton of money, though, for those, those large trials, right? They, they, they need a ton of money for that. What we do, though, is at True Diagnostic, we work with private companies. So supplement companies, or I mean, they can be public. We will actually run and help them run an institutional review board, a clinical trial, get it approved for them, give them testing at cost to do before and after. We would even hook them up with a healthcare provider if they need a study location. We can help with patient recruitment or involvement. And then um, they can even be like a patient pay trial too. So at True Diagnostic, we can do them a lot cheaper. I don't know that most people know we have those resources and those capabilities, but you'll see these larger trials really never be pushed through to completion because of the very large amount of money they need to uh, run these more kind of publicly funded trials. Yeah, it's uh, very expensive to run these publicly funded trials. I wonder if there are a certain group of people who are actually supposed to experiment on themselves, right? And try out all these things, even if there are no randomized controlled trials for them. Like, is there a kind that's kind? Yeah. I mean, you could like, you you could take our entire healthcare provider network, right? So we have a a total list of around a hundred thousand of these healthcare providers in the integrative functional medicine space who are pioneers in aging medicine. They're really on the frontier. They're trying all these cutting edge medications. They have been for years, rapamycin, metformin, supplements like A-carbos, other medications like geopens. Who are they? They are mainly our our main audience, right? Healthcare providers who are treating aging as a disease. They're anti-aging clinics or the the cash pay medicine clinics who don't take, you know, insurance. So those those are the providers. That's our, our target ideal, you know, customer profile. And They've been doing these medications, these supplements, these new cutting edge anti-aging therapies on their patients for decades. 
right? They, they have that data. Mm -hmm, they have mm -hmm. their blood-based values. They have their hormone levels. And there are companies, there's one in particular, where they're trying to target those healthcare providers and get the healthcare providers to just create a clinical study or institutional review board within their clinic so they can extract that patient data and use it to prove that those medications they've already been prescribing for years are improving health outcomes. So that's one pretty simple way you can get around it. No one has done it yet, though. And there is another one. There is a group of people that we, as a, on a societal level, not only tolerate, but encourage them to go to the extreme, to try out a bunch of extreme things on themselves. And that group of people is called athletes. So this is really interesting. In, in all kinds of sports, the rules of the sports are transcending the rules of the actual laws and ethics, because now it's okay to, to, to fight each other. Now it's okay to lie to the other person because that's the sport. We are calling it bluffing in this context, you know, and, and that's where the longevity Olympics comes in. Sometimes if we really want to see some innovation, best way to go about it is to fuck around and we find out that's a great platform at the longevity Olympics for that. It is. I like that. Now about the pace of aging pace of aging over lifetime, how in average, how does it look like? So how does the Dunedin pace look like when you're young, you're aging fast or aging slow? And as you're getting older, like, what does it look like? Yeah, I can send you the Dunedin pace paper as well. Obviously, they're using a very unique cohort, right? About 17 Dunedin New Zealanders. And what they notice in that population level graph is, for whatever reason, your pace of aging is going to increase as you become older chronologically as well. So I think that's what you're asking, right? We see a very linear association as linear? you become older chronologically. Yeah, your pace of aging is going to go up. What's, what I think is really cool is we see that same trend in our true diagnostic cohort. The Dunedin cohort is, is very interesting because they are going to be, air quotes, healthier than a traditional American cohort. And then true diagnostic, we're testing very, very healthy people as well. So when you lie the graphs on top of e each other, they're almost perfect. They're, they're, they're almost completely aligned with one another, but they do follow that same trend. Yeah, for, for the Rejuvenation Olympics, like if you're applying what I just said to that, right, people who are older, it's going to be harder for them to keep the pace of aging lower. So it's more impressive when people who are chronologically much older have a lower pace of aging. And the curve here is like this. It's not like this. There is never a dip in, in the Dunedin pace. It's always just going up. Uh -huh. Yeah, for the data that they have on it um, at this time. Now, again, what's really interesting about the Dunedin cohort is they've already taken the fifth round of samples. So that the algorithm right now that we use is when the cohort was aged at 45 years old. They're working on getting the fifth round of data. The people in the cohort are about 52 years old, as you can imagine. Tracking down 1,100 people who are now dispersed throughout the world is pretty difficult. I've been lucky enough to meet a couple people actually in the Dunedin cohort myself and, and you know relatives of people who are in it. So they're working on capturing more of that data and will probably have an upgraded algorithm, which again will be more precise, accurate, related to health outcomes in like the next year or so. And they'll, they'll release a, a new, you know, publication on that too. What's something that you strongly believe to be the case, but very few people agree with you on? It's a great question. There's definitely many things out there. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of the one which is like the most. Pe people probably tend to argue, or I would imagine them arguing with the fact that biological age testing is not the number one test that they can test on themselves, friends, family members, their patients in the case of a healthcare provider. Because when you think about it, if you're healthy, it may make a little bit more sense to take this test if you're wanting to you know, optimize your own health. But even if you're sick, if you have cancer, if you have heart disease, if you have COVID, if you have, you know, long haulers COVID, this is still your number one risk factor, right? We get all of these other diseases 
because we're aging. Now, if you have cancer, heart disease, COVID, long haulers, COVID, aging's not going to be your primary concern. So it makes sense as to why you're not going to take the test. But if you are aging faster at any point in your life, you are definitively at an increased risk of all cause mortality and morbidity. I don't think people argue on that part. I think they argue the value of actually knowing the outcome and being able to effectively change it and understand that you can reduce your risk. Your current project is, is the, the, the true diagnostic, but you also have another company, which is everything epigenetics. What's the, what's the story there? Yeah. So early days, true diagnostic, we realized no one knew anything about epigenetics. We didn't know much. We were learning as new studies came out. So we always wanted to create more of an educational arm or platform outside of true diagnostic. We had really a massive vision for it. We wanted to host public meetings on Fridays, kind of like these journal clubs to update people, research roundups, have a newsletter. It really just be an extension of true diagnostic and understanding the promise of epigenetics and all of the, the applications, clinical and non-clinical. As with every Thing else, we got too busy. It got put on the back burner. And then in December, a couple years ago, I just said, screw it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to create, I'm going to make everything epigenetics my, my own. I'm going to create more of an educational platform or just tell people what I'm already doing and keep them updated with what I'm already reading anyways, in case other people are interested and want to listen. So I don't monetize it in any way. I have a newsletter that sometimes goes out every month if I have time. Um, I have a Twitter page, an Instagram, a website. Instagram is probably where I'm most active. I'm actually getting ready to start releasing blog posts on my website as well. If people want to digest information from more of a reading standpoint. But I think it will come to a, a point where it's going to be like, you know, Andrew Huberman of the world, Rhonda Patrick of the world, right? Peter Atia of the world. Epigenetics is going to play into every single thing that they're talking about. We just don't know it yet, right? Epigenetics came out after the first iPhone, which is insane to say. It's that new, right? We could only really measure these markers about 10 years ago. So it's really exciting. I hope to, you know, involve more people in it in the future, create more of a community around it. But I, you know, again, don't monetize it and don't have any plans to monetize it anytime soon either. What are you monetizing? How can people buy something from you? In terms of true diagnostic or epigenetic? Everything epigenetic. No, in terms of uh, abstract marketplace, you are bringing goods and services and values to other people to, in exchange of other values. So how can they... How can they exchange value with you? <laughs> What's the best way? Yeah. And, in test. terms of people, <laughs> oh, buy the test. I mean, that's, yes, right? That's, that's the, the, the main, main point, main flagship product we, we have at True Diagnostic, right? Because then you're actually able to apply some of the learnings you may have heard on everything epigenetics to um, factor a, a change or to make a change. It's really important to retest right? It's, it's a cool test. You get, you get your numbers back, but with your hormone levels, with your CBC panel, you'd never test once and then not make a change and retest to see how that's being affected. So if anything, the, the second, third, fourth test are way more important than that initial test that you're doing. So yes, by the test. Secondarily, I love knowledge and information. So if you can share any information or knowledge with me or set up a time to chat, I love conversations like this where I can just stay up to date and learn more and, and be, be questioned and pushed to the limits. Um, that's, you know, a, a great way that I would love to exchange value with, with people. Right. That was a blast. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and information with us. Of course. Thanks for having me.